So the first roadblock that I thought of immediately when Veronica and I were talking about the subject was just getting an evaluation. So some things that I encountered again as a school psychologist, as a special ed coordinator, and now as an advocate, when a parent wants to initiate an evaluation, sometimes they are just strictly ignored. So it could be that the school district just ignores your request. It could be that they sort of say, we'll get to that, we'll talk about that and never do. It could be that you have a meeting. If you get as far as to have a meeting, but then it doesn't really go anywhere after that. So the first roadblock is just strictly being ignored. So my advice to parents is make sure you make a request in writing. If it wasn't in writing, it didn't happen. So don't make a phone call. Don't make, don't have a you know, voicemail. Don't talk to somebody in the pickup line. Make sure you email the appropriate people to make your request known. Those people would be the school psychologist, special ed coordinator, any related services that you might think that your child needs, so a speech pathologist, occupational therapist, maybe even include the principal of your child's building, but make sure you get it to the right people. The first two people are really key, the school psych and special ed coordinator, because those are the two people who are responsible for getting those evaluations underway. So make sure it's in writing. Make sure that you track how long um, it's been since you made that request. So I say two business days, right? Because at the end of the day, I think if you go longer than that, you're being ignored. So if you've waited two business days, you're still not hearing anything back, reach back out, do a follow-up email. You know, I emailed you on whatever date, requesting an evaluation for my child. I haven't heard back yet. I look forward to your response. Again, in writing. So don't let time go to waste. Make sure you get that evaluation underway as quickly as you can. Because we all know that once you get consent signed, right, it's a whole time, um, you know, 30 days, 45 days, 60 days, whatever it is, right? So make sure you get those requests um, in in a timely manner. And email is sufficient. It doesn't have to oh, be yeah. a written letter, certified mail or anything. Yeah, absolutely. I think that you can send a letter. But again, being on the school side, there would be times when parents would say they'd send a letter and it just didn't get to us. We lived in a rural area. And sometimes those mail carriers just aren't great about giving mail to you. So I think email, absolutely. And I know there's a way, which I, I'm not sure how, there is a way to, to have um, like a sender say they, they viewed it. I'm not sure how to do that, but there's that too. So you can see if someone has viewed your email. Um, but number two, if you actually have a meeting or you have a response from the district, but they say, no, sorry, we don't suspect a disability. That is a very common roadblock that I see as an advocate, especially. Now, a district has the right to do that. It is within their procedural safeguards. Just say we don't expect a disability and they have to issue you a letter, a um, prior written notice stating why they don't suspect a disability. As a parent, I would always advise to ask for that documentation. Ask for whatever support that the district is using to deny your request. If it's data, if it's you know, state test scores, grades, um, attendance, sometimes with the attendance laws, especially if you're looking at a learning disability, if your child has missed a lot of school, they may use that as a reason to not suspect a disability. Um, sometimes I see a, a newer kindergartner, or let's say you transferred schools recently. So there are there are some reasons that I do think are warranted at times for a district to say no, not yet. Either way, you need to have it in writing. So if they deny, then you need to ask for that written notice and you need to ask for the data supporting their denial. Now, even if they deny, that doesn't mean it's a denial forever, right? You do have some, um, some different avenues you can take. If you truly suspect your child has a disability, the district says no, and you don't really love the data they're giving you. I mean, I've had, I've had this where a district will use grades, for instance, when your child gets good grades. Well, that doesn't mean anything. Right? They use grades or they may use um, like MAP or STAR, like a curriculum based assessment, which is good. It's data, but it's one piece of data. So if you, if you feel strongly that the district is in the wrong in this decision, push back. You can ask for mediation. You can file a state complaint. You can, you can go so far as to file due process. You do have rights to be able to push this forward. Now, one sort of, um, I don't know, <laughs> go around 
So I had a, I had a particular student and um, she actually does have ADHD. We were trying to get her evaluated for other health impairment. They said, no, we don't see it. But she also had a speech articulation problem. So we said, let's evaluate for speech then. And they said, okay, because <laughs> you can't deny the articulation errors, right? You hear them. Um, so we were able to get her evaluated for that. Now in that planning meeting, we asked for specific reading assessments. And being smart, right, I'm tying them back to the articulation error, but knowing in my head, I'm tying it back to the ADHD. And, and they denied those requests. The school psych said, no, we don't see that. So then what we were able to do is push for an independent evaluation at that point in time. Because we said, hey, your speech evaluation did not cover all of our concerns. We made these concerns known, we made our requests known, and you denied it. Therefore, we don't agree with this evaluation. And the district approved our um, request for an independent education evaluation. So one scenario where we were able to kind of go around the district's denial, because again, they denied the request initially, um, able to go around it with a different disability, and then got our independent education evaluation, which showed ADHD and showed difficulties with reading and executive functioning. We were able to then get the district to agree to redo their ETR. So <laughs> long story, but there's ways around it. You got to be crafty and creative sometimes. Yeah. Um, Can I jump in and ask a question here too? So yeah, how about sure. for the situation where somebody's challenges maybe don't show up at school, right? But they come home and they have anxiety and, and all of the things that can go along with it. Um, and it's, it's significant, but it's not, it doesn't look like hardcore data at first. Like, what do you do then? Yeah. I mean, I've had a couple of kiddos that have had autism. It's not ADHD, but autism where they um, can hold it together at school just fine. But yes, at home, they're a mess. And that has taken, honestly, a lot of time um, for the parent to collect data on their own. Um, you know, if that child is going to specialists outside of school, collecting data there, paying for an independent evaluation to get more information. Um, and, and what you see oftentimes is that it takes time, but with that time, the child starts to break down those barriers at school. So I think especially young kids, they can hold it together for a while, but then they can't any longer. And then you see like a sensory integration problems or you know, they kind of start small, but if you're looking for them, I think you can find them. And, and sometimes requesting like a functional behavior assessment for the small things is easier than requesting a full-blown ETR. So if you have a child that again, usually it's a sensory processing where they're struggling, but it's not really affecting their overall performance in school, but it is, right? You can find those small things. So trying again, trying to have someone's eyes on the problem your OT is a great resource or an IS, an intervention specialist that you work with closely. Um, but unfortunately, I guess my answer to you is sometimes it just takes time to really make your case and collect that data and that information to show to the school. Because you're right. If a school says they don't have a problem in school, then they can deny that request. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Not an easy answer necessarily. Um, but yeah, I think you just have to collect that information on your own. I think with the COVID shutdown, that helped. Um, because so many parents were at home with their kids and they were able to say like, Hey, this, my student's really struggling, um, to access the curriculum, the way it's presented. And I think that helped a lot of cases, um, that were kind of beforehand getting pushed. Yeah. Um, thirdly is the RTA runaround. I don't know if you see this, I'm sure parents see it everywhere, but you know, the law states a school district cannot deny an evaluation due to RTI, response intervention, or now it's MTSS, right? Multi-tiered systems of support. Um, whatever you wanna call it, it's the same thing. And I don't know, honestly, I don't see it so much now, but as a school site, I used to get that all the time from teachers. Um, well, we need to start interventions, you know, six weeks. And then we'll come back to the table and then we'll talk about it, which they do, right? And they're like, eh, they're making some progress. <laughs> let's, let's keep going another six weeks. Or that didn't work, let's try something else. Let's go another six weeks. And then you're looking at May. Um, so just know that a district cannot, by law, deny that request due to collecting response intervention data or providing interventions. What the law says is while you're going through that evaluation, RTI should be happening. Those interventions should be taking place while you're under that 60 day timeline to get the evaluation completed. And really interventions should be happening. 
right? I mean, this should be happening. But I can't tell you how many times I've heard that from teachers. And, and really, to me, it is just, it's just a way to push it back. I mean, I get that interventions are successful and can be successful. But if you have enough information to support an evaluation, then just do the evaluation. Mm-hmm. For the parent who's sitting here thinking, what is RTI? Can yeah. you go into that? So response intervention. It is providing interventions to a child who is struggling, who is falling below a benchmark. Again, we'll pull in star or map, right? We have those lovely color benchmarks. The students who are falling below like that 25th percentile, 20th percentile, interventions are then provided to those students in the specific area that they're struggling in. So basic reading, reading comprehension, reading fluency, math calculation, those areas, they're supposed to be specific. And it's a tiered approach. So the bottom tier is tier three, I'm sorry, tier one, I was thinking it's tier one, which is whole group. So it's like, for instance, on Wilson Foundations, which is a basic reading program that's provided to all of the kids in the classroom. Those kids, it's usually 20% of those kids don't, um, don't get it. They're not, they're not progressing with that. So those 20% are going to get a small group reading intervention, um, Title I reading programs, um, intervention specialists who might pull reading groups, and they're going to be in a small group, usually three to five kids, getting a different, it's supposed to be a different intervention, but it's in addition to tier one, tier one, tier two. All those tier two kiddos, there's about 5% that are still struggling, and they move on to tier three, which is individualized or on a two to one ratio that's more intense. So the intensity increases, but again, you're still getting tier one, tier two, and then tier three. Um, and so usually you see intervention just happening like three times a week, three to four times a week for a good period of time when you combine all those interventions. And then of those 5%, there's going to be a small percentage of kids who are still struggling, who then would be evaluated for special education services. So again, as you can hear me saying it, right, it does take time sometimes to get up to tier three. It doesn't have to. Oftentimes you see kids coming in to the grade level and they already have data on those kids. They already know where they're struggling, right? So those interventions should be taking place regardless of the time frame, And it shouldn't be, hey, I requested evaluation as a parent. Now you start RTI. No, that should have already been happening. So oftentimes schools will say, well, we need to, okay, tier two isn't working. We're going to go tier three. I'm going to give it six weeks and we'll remit again. So it just is, to me, it's just a time factor, right? Those interventions should be happening all along. They should be happening throughout the, the evaluation. And two, even if your child has an IEP, they can still be getting RTA services. Like if your child is struggling with math and they have an, uh, an IEP goal in math, let's say their reading comprehension is also struggling, but not to the severity that they qualified for a goal, they can still receive RTI in that area. And again, a lot of school districts nowadays They all have district-wide RTI programs. These ones that I work with in Ohio. Um, So hopefully your district does have an RTI program. But yeah, anyway, the crux of the matter is don't let them tell you we're waiting. (laughs) We're waiting to do RTI before we evaluate. 